we hit the Great Basin, which was actually extremely challenging. It's this several day section that CDT hikers and Great Divide bikers both go through. Um, really dry, no no resources, really exposed, very windy. And so that was challenging. And I was okay though. And in the basin, Matt's stomach started going weird. Can I talk about this yet? Are we are we at this point where things went bad? <laughs> cool. From the time we open our eyes in the morning till we close them at night to fall asleep, our days are filled with thousands of decisions. Some decisions are small, like, do I eat this giant pile of biscuits and gravy for breakfast? Or keep it lighter with some yogurt and berries? Other decisions will change the very trajectory of your life. Maybe this summer, you're going to finally ditch that office job and go work on the river. Or maybe, first, let's just learn how to back up a trailer. The same process of decision making plays out every time we plan a backcountry adventure. Where to go, what to bring, and to which partner do we place our trust with this very important and precious allotment of our time in the mountains. So many of these backcountry-based decisions are focused on accident prevention. We choose to carry certain items in order to prevent knowable outcomes. A puffy coat to ward off the cold, for instance, or a headlamp to see in the dark. And other things we decide to carry with us to anticipate surprises from Mother Nature. Bear spray in case we run into a grizzly bear. Thank you for joining us for another episode of The Fine Line. I'm Matt Hansen. In this episode, we'll hear how this process of decision making played out during an epic bikepacking journey. Last summer, Maggie Slepian and Matt Marr made the decision to pedal their bikes across the entire Great Divide bike trail, which goes from the Mexican border up north through the Rockies and into Canada. During their trip, a seemingly little decision came back to haunt them in a big way, right when they entered one of the most remote parts of Teton County, Wyoming. Our conversation also reveals the arduousness of long distance cycling and how, during our times of greatest need, we can rely on the kindness of complete strangers. The Fine Line is produced by Backcountry Zero, a program from Teton County Search and Rescue Foundation that focuses on preventative search and rescue. Through Backcountry Zero initiatives like this podcast and many different educational programs, we strive to elevate backcountry safety skills and awareness in order to reduce fatalities and serious injuries in our surrounding public lands. The interviews were recorded in the studios of KHOL 89.1 FM in Jackson. For more news and stories about Jackson Hole, make sure you subscribe to Jackson Unpacked, a weekly podcast produced by our partners right here at KHOL. After this quick break, we'll come back and hit the long, weary road to Mosquito Lake. My name is Kelly Hill. I'm the head of product at Steo, presenting sponsor of the Fine Line podcast. I have the privilege of creating products that are responsibly made and keep people connected, comfortable, and protected in the mountains. I love chatting with customers while I'm out and about in our products, hearing what they love, what works for them, and what we can do better keeps me excited about improving our products year over year to allow more people to have more fun outside. We know how important recreating in the backcountry is for our culture and our community, which is why Steo is a proud supporter of the Fine Line podcast and Teton County Search and Rescue. Be safe out there and remember to let the outside in at steo.com. The basin was pretty, I thought, for the first, you know, a couple miles, the the stark, empty beauty of it with the wild horses running around and everything. But it was so exposed, which is something we ran into a lot on the trip as we're both coming from this, like, more of a hiking background where you're on a trail and you have trees and everything over you or you're in the woods a lot more. Just the exposure with the, the sun, you can never get away from it, and the, and the wind. And we tried to get up really early and start our days before the wind and the sun really fully kicked in. I'm Matt Marr. See, I've been living in, in Bozeman, Montana now for the last 10 years. Um, for the last eight, been working as a backpacking guide in the kind of the spring, summer, fall, mostly down in Yellowstone National Park, and then kind of veering off there into the Wind River Range and uh, the Tetons. And then the spring and fall, I try to extend some of that that nice nice warm weather and go down to southern Utah to guide. 
And then um, in the winter, I've been doing backcountry ski guiding and uh, teaching avalanche classes for the last four years now. But, you know, crossing that basin kind of killed both of us uh, a little bit. At one point, we had to just pull up on the side of the of this dirt road and just set up, throw up our tent real quick and endure these like 60 mile an hour, like micro storm bursts that two of them passed over us. So, you know, that's, that's always fun. These super intense thunder and lightning storms, wind storms. Yeah. My, at the same time, my stomach wasn't feeling so great then. You never really feel great on these long distance things. You're kind of just trying to survive. Every, every year or two, it, it pops into my head. Like I should go do something really hard and, really long in the backcountry, and the great divide mountain bike route which goes from just right around the mexico border through new mexico and then colorado wyoming montana and into canada had been on my radar for a while my name is maggie slepian i am a full-time writer in the outdoor industry i'm originally from new hampshire and i moved to bozeman in 2012 after working as a horseback guide in national parks for a few years I still ride horses in a professional capacity when Westerns come to town. I'm a film wrangler, and so I ride horses for movies. I had done a few other shorter bikepacking trips, kind of honing my gear every trip and nothing nothing more than a couple hundred miles. But um, the idea of an extended bikepacking trip was really appealing. It was a new type of challenge. The seeds of bikepacking as an activity are rooted on the Great Divide mountain bike route, which was mapped out by the Adventure Cycling Association in 1997. Bikepacking.com calls it the most important and recognizable off-pavement cycling route in the United States, if not the world. Matt and Maggie's window of opportunity had them riding the route from south to north on what they called an average touring pace, or about 50 to 80 miles a day. They were hoping to get the whole thing done, about 2,700 miles in just eight weeks. So the Great Divide mountain bike route is mostly run on gravel bikes. So Matt and I both had rigid drop bar bikes, which meant there was no suspension in the front. And a lot of people do ride front suspension. So they'll ride kind of a combination gravel bike and hardtail mountain bike. Um, But we were riding more of um, a streamlined setup with racing bags. And so we weren't racing, but we were pretty ultra light coming from our backpacking backgrounds. And so we had pretty minimal setups. And so the term mountain bike route is a little misleading because most of it is on four wheel drive roads. There's some sections of pavement. And so kind of unlike these backpacking trips I've done, the Great Divide goes around the wilderness areas because you can't have bicycles in wilderness. And so you're in a lot of national forests, a lot of other jurisdictions of public land on dirt roads. And it it's it was developed by the Adventure Cycling Association. And it links together kind of this incredible network of um, Jeep roads, two track, four wheel drive roads, some single track, and then you are definitely on some pavement um, more in some sections more than others. We both kind of had just Um, you know, regular steel gravel bikes, Um, nothing like super lightweight carbon fiber or anything in terms of bikes. But then we had a couple different bags. The big one is kind of the frame bag that goes in the triangle there in your frame. And then a seat post bag that kind of like attaches to your, the bottom of your seat post and extends out over your back tire. Um, And then um, another bag that kind of attached to your front, um, your handlebars there. Uh, and then there's an assortment of other bags you can add to, you know, the, the front um, fork or back fork if you have the attachments. So you can just throw that in the bike. Um, it's lightweight to begin with. Traveling in the summer, we didn't need a bunch of warm weather stuff. Um, um, and then one thing Maggie didn't touch on with uh, going north instead of going south is that we knew we'd be facing more wind because the route kind of jags like southeast, northwest, depending on which way you're going. Um, and with that prevailing wind in America coming out of the west, <clears throat> when you have your bike all set up like a big streamlined thing, it likes to catch all that all that wind um, and kind of become a sail. So moving north, that was like a, a big battle that we didn't 
take into account so much was how much wind we'd be facing with our, our big sailing bikes. No, I was going to say, I still on foot now, this is what, like six months later, I still, when I get hit in the face with wind, I get this like, like flash of rage flashbacks from being on the bike route and just pedaling as hard as I can down a slight incline into a headwind, like in my granny gear, just fighting this wind with my bike sail. Yeah. I didn't touch on that because I don't like talking about the wind. Yeah. My issue with the packing was my bike frames a size small. And the amount of capacity that that reduced for me made a huge difference. I was really struggling with the bag setup I had and kind of the weird shape of bike bags. And so you have three kind of weird triangular shaped bags that you have to really utilize every corner and every inch of space in. And on my small bike, I had less space between my tire and my seat post. So I couldn't fill my seat post bag all the way. My frame bag was maybe half the size of Matt's just because of my bike's geometry and the size of it. Their packing list was similar to what you'd see on an ultralight backpacking trip, stripped down even further to fit everything on their bikes, plus all the standard bike tools to handle any mechanical issues. And water. Lots of water. And there was one thing missing. We'll get to that later. And so, and then I also had my handlebars were much more narrow than Matt's, and so my even my front bag on my handlebars which i thought i'd be able to fill to capacity was limited by my drop bars and so for water i ended up when we needed extra capacity in new mexico through these incredibly hot dry sections i had to strap a big camelback two liter bag to the top of my seat post bag with bungees i had um, attachments on my front forks to put one of those big canteen style nalgene bottles on Um, i had I had water just strapped everywhere on the bike and packing was one of the surprisingly challenging parts of this, just kind of given my bike's geometry and size and um, yeah, kind of the limited food capacity. We did not carry backpacks. We didn't have anything else. We just had our bike bags. And so, yeah, we had, we had some sections where we had to carry a lot of, yeah, seven or eight liters of water easily. We shared a tent, so we split the tent up um, and each took half of it. Um, Maggie didn't want to bring a stove because she thought we'd be eating at gas stations every day, but uh, we brought a stove in the end, which was good because there were stretches where it was six days in between kind of humanity. So Maggie's more used to cold soaking meals and doing that like long distance backpacking style, but it's nice to have the, the ease of a warm meal and coffee in the morning. And then a lot of water capacity to get us through through New Mexico, at least, where there is, is a lot drier. So we were carrying, see, at most, maybe seven or eight liters each. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, with a liter weighing 2.2 pounds, it's, you know, adding another 15 pounds onto a bike that's 25 pounds and gear that's another 15 or 20. So they were um, not fast climbers it was uh slow going uphill and then charging like a bowling ball down the hills any kind of ultra endurance backcountry endeavor like that is you're gonna have your good days and bad days and in the end you know you're you're glad you did it hopefully um but yeah it's it's definitely it's an experience and it's a certain type of fun but by the time we got to wyoming i was obviously used to it we were almost halfway done with the route um in that section of Wyoming, um, we'd gone through New Mexico and Colorado and hit the Wyoming border. And I was feeling good. I was consistently behind Matt every day. Matt's bike has a lot more torque and Matt's a stronger cyclist than I am. And so we would not bike together all the time. He'd be a mile or two ahead of me and then wait at intersections. And we'd obviously take our breaks together. But I was feeling fine. I was used to it. We'd been out there for almost a month when we hit the Wyoming border. And yeah, I was feeling good. Um, we hit the Great Basin, which was actually extremely challenging. It's this several day section that CDT hikers and Great Divide bikers both go through. Um, really dry, no no resources, really exposed, very windy. And so that was challenging. And I was okay, though. And in the basin, Matt's stomach started going weird. Can I talk about this yet? Are we Are we at this point where things went bad? <laughs> Cool. Um, And so suddenly 
we kind of, Matt was saying that he felt bloated and gassy and both had kind of bad stomachs. So I didn't think much of it, except we're eating weird stuff and maybe we didn't rehydrate that rice all the way, you know, uh, cause we didn't have enough water. So whatever. So yeah, your stomach is kind of weird on a long distance backcountry thing. I've never been on a long route where my stomach felt good the whole time. So I didn't think much of it. And I thought maybe we just didn't rehydrate rice correctly. And his stomach was not happy for me having to eat too much rice. But after the basin, I was faster than Matt, which for we'd been, it was, you know, 1400 miles at that point of biking where he had been faster than me. And it was definitely like a little bit of an alarm bell in my head. Like I'm not a faster cyclist than Matt. And so why am I continually like, why am I like doing as well or ahead now? So I didn't, I didn't think a ton about it. And it's one of those things where you don't really notice you don't feel great, but you don't notice your like energy reserves just starting to decline. Um, and then, you know, coming out of the basin, I think we, we hit a couple of good days cause it was kind of stormy and cloudy. So we didn't have that sun beating down on us all day. And then we had for the first time in like a week, a tailwind. So we were like cruising along the front of the wind rivers. We had like the winds out to our, our east or to our right just like beautiful unfolding with all the cows and horses running around and like the sun through these really uh, intense gray clouds and storm clouds and kind of rolling like roller coaster hills where you can pick up enough speed to just coast up over the next hill kind of you know really nice biking and that kind of brought us almost into Pinedale and then coming into Pinedale I was flagging really hard I feel like I just used all the energy and kind of what I had in me to get there and then kind of just hit a wall when we got to Pinedale. I usually don't nap during the middle of the day, but I remember rolling into town at like two o'clock and opening the door of the hotel room and just face planting on the bed and not waking up for maybe like four hours or something, which is not usually how I go about things. But I remember sitting on the hotel room bed and seeing Matt in the mirror and and just because we, you know, you don't see each other without clothes on really on these things. You're just wearing your base layers to sleep in and then putting your cycling clothes on in the morning right away. And so it was my first time seeing Matt really without a shirt on in a while. And I went, Oh my God, you have lost a lot of weight. I could see like his shoulder blades and his spine and his ribs. And I had biked at that point, you know, around 1500 miles. And somehow I looked exactly the same as the day I left Bozeman, but Matt, I, was like, holy cow, dude, you are looking really skinny. Have you lost a lot of weight? I think that you look really bad, respectfully. You don't look good. And then he passed out asleep. And I watched the bear on Hulu on my phone for the afternoon. I I never really thought, I didn't think about calling it quits. Hindsight is twenty twenty, but I thought that I would just be sick like a food bug, be sick for 24 hours and then start feeling better again. <laughs> you know, that night in Pinedale, I was just like, we'll sleep it off. I'll feel better enough the next day to get going again. You know, we didn't want to waste a bunch of money just hanging out at a hotel and not going anywhere in Pinedale. When they arrived in Pinedale, the cyclists took a full day off their bikes in order to rest. They had already ridden 1,500 miles, and it was only their second day off. And I knew I was, like, skinny because I hadn't been just been eating this like backpacker food basically and not enough calories to kind of equal what I was burning. I think I felt better than the day before. So I thought I was on like the upward trend. Um, but my body was like teetering on the brink of, uh, of starting to consume itself and, uh, go into like ketosis and uh, kind of like the pains that come along with that, that I wasn't aware of. That's kind of where, where things fall apart. You are listening to The Fine Line. We'll be right back. This episode of The Fine Line is sponsored by Arcteryx. Based in the coast mountains of British Columbia, Arcteryx specializes in technical, high-performance apparel, outerwear, and equipment solutions to meet the needs of the mountain athlete and Teton County search and rescue volunteers. When you see TCSAR members out there wearing yellow jackets during a rescue mission, you know they are wearing the Alpine Guide Jacket from Arcteryx. Learn more at arcteryx.com. On Friday morning, July 7th, the cyclists woke up in Pinedale, repacked their bikes, checked the air in their tires, and saddled up for their next destination, 
another 50 miles to Mosquito Lake. Along the way, they would gain another 1,800 vertical feet of elevation, with most of that coming in the last five miles over a gnarly dirt road. This day has burned into my memory. Definitely procrastinating, packing my bike and leaving and getting back on the bike. And I remember Matt saying, oh, you just don't want to get back on your bike. I'm like, well, that's true. But also, I don't think that you should leave town. Like, I'm not, I don't think, I know you say you're doing well, but I just don't believe it. And so, but we did. So we left. And we left around 11 a.m. We were aiming for Mosquito Lake. Um, we had a GPS app that could kind of show us where campsites were and what the elevation looked like. And Mosquito Lake was a good distance. It was between 50 and 55 miles out of Pinedale. And so it was a really nice day. And we, the route leaving Pinedale starts on pavement and you ride, don't fact check me on this, but you ride 50, 10, 10 or so miles on pavement leaving town. And then you take roads past these fields with cows. Remember, we stopped to take pictures of all the cows and you still have the winds right there. And it's really beautiful. It was, leaving town was a really nice ride. Um, you you leave the pavement, you turn onto this really nice, what they call champagne gravel, um, super smooth gravel, which still we're getting passed by a lot of um, four wheelers and ATVs and even RVs and people with truck toppers. Um, I can't remember if it was a weekend or not, but there were that summer, on the route along the route we were on there was a ton of people camping kind of the whole way at these more populated areas and so we biked um a couple hours and then got to this intersection this popular campsite by a river and stopped for a snack and then we biked another few miles kind of the road getting worse and more rutted um heading up towards the lake area and that's kind of where we stopped seeing anybody uh, because I think everyone either went in a different direction down one of the more populated roads or they stopped at that campsite and it was then the roads got really bad really really gnarly for biking on and we were kind of I was in granny gear kind of slow to a crawl doing this really long extended climb and we did not see a single other vehicle after leaving that populated campsite. And then I felt we kept, we were following our route and we kept turning onto these roads that were progressively more remote and with worse tread. And we passed one cyclist on the Great Divide going in the opposite direction, a southbound cyclist. And um, then that was it until we got to the lake. And so we did the 50, 55 miles. It was, way, it was light out when we got there. So probably by like five or so. We weren't making super bad time and Matt said he was feeling better and so I felt more relaxed because he said he was feeling better and he was like he was keeping up his normal pace and everything even though um and so we were really remote but I wasn't worried anymore because that ride went pretty well even though it was challenging and the road was really bad. We were experiencing the big dried ruts on the side and then puddles in the middle left over and then washboard and just kind of bad bad tread overall and we'd had a lot of sections of kind of bad surface and this was I could tell that why there was no one up there with vehicles at that time it was not pleasant right before they got to Mosquito Lake they entered Teton County at the lake they found just one other family camping out they had a couple kids a dog and a trailer which they had towed all the way from Pennsylvania on their own epic summer road trip Mosquito Lake is very remote and the um we had it to ourselves, maybe a side by side or two went past throughout the day on Saturday. We had a nice, huge herd of elk go in the distance, a coyote around the edge of it, a bull moose run a cow away. And like we did a lot of traveling. So our Saturday at Mosquito Lake was kind of relaxed. Uh, we took the kayak down and put it on the water and hung around camp and just played with the kids. and. Here late in the afternoon, come two bikers down our little spur road to our camp, and very polite. And uh, I think it was Maggie asked, you know, is it okay if we camp here next to you guys? And it's like, um, sure. My name is Mike Baum, and I live in Orrstown, Pennsylvania. I travel each summer with my wife, Katie. And we now have a five-year-old named Henry and a two-year-old named Elsie. And with this past couple of years, we got an Australian cattle dog named Ruby. And it's our summer. My wife and I both teach. I teach third grade. She teaches fifth grade. And we take the summers and we travel and explore. Not exactly sure how the conversation went, but they went and set out their tent 
out behind us a little bit, out of sight. And maybe I grumbled a little bit about not having the privacy we had. But uh, later that evening, almost dark, uh, I saw Matt walk back out. And uh, I knew they came in on bikes. And I went up to Matt afterward, or that, when he came back out. And I felt, I apologize. We didn't offer him water. They, I know they spent the whole day in bikes. And just went up and talked about, hey, do you need anything? Do you need water? You know, at sunset time, I think Maggie was already was already in the tent. She would already already called called it that day and I went out just to watch the sunset over the lake and the the father from the other family was out there and we were talking about you know they were on this big like month-long um you know car trip with the family Matt talked about their experience coming up from the Mexico border and what they were doing and just a pretty awesome experience that they were going through and then they said that they were good and that was it I talked for a little bit but that was pretty much the only interaction we had. They were quiet neighbors, and it was nice to have them nearby. Yeah, so you know, I was hanging out with with that other with the with the dad from that other group, and I felt you know my stomach it felt unsettled, but it didn't feel like terrible. Like, and then I went to sleep, and in the middle of the night, you know, probably like midnight, it started just feeling terrible, like seizing pain in my in my stomach kind where I couldn't, you know, I couldn't think of sleeping at all. Like it just had me up and then crawling out of the tent because I had to go to the bathroom and then going back in. And I didn't really know what the pain was. And I had these like really gnarly burps that kind of like really extended and they had a, like a Dr. Pepper smell to them. We were, we were saying like weird carbonated fruity smell. And, you know, finding out later that like ketosis burps, my ba- my body had basically, I had no fat reserves left and it was just basically eating muscle, consuming itself. And I think the pain of that at that stage is kind of a lot of like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a medical professional here at all, but felt like my stomach was just like consuming itself and like the acid and everything in there was just building up. And on top of that, top of everything there going on, I just had a lot of like, pain from this stomach virus I had gotten so it was weird because the day before I had had enough energy to bike 50 miles and sit out uh, and enjoy the sunset and then that morning the next morning I woke up and it was a struggle to just crawl like five feet away from the tent to to throw up Maggie asked basically if like if I was going to be able to bike out of there and and that wasn't I couldn't see that happening. If I couldn't even move five feet, um, I knew basically either end, like back to Pinedale was 50 miles or kind of onward to to Coulter Bay or like the pass up there was another 30, 40 miles over a pretty rough road. I wasn't going to die out there, but I was not going to move without without help. Like Maggie proposed, we had, we had biked in and we'd seen a ranger station beforehand some some miles before or maybe not a ranger station but a cabin or something there and there's a truck and that was our, our idea is maybe like we can get this this government employee in their truck you know it's really close by maybe we can we can call someone and, and get a hold of them and somehow they can because they're close maybe they could give us a ride we saw the truck we couldn't abandon the bikes because that would mean leaving one of us there with them we didn't have locks to tether them anywhere and we so we were kind of stuck in a sense we saw that truck bed and we thought maybe we could throw the bikes in the truck bed and do that but you know I was kind of just in a fog of trying to fend off the the demons in my stomach so Maggie was more on top of kind of all that that morning for one thing, this is kind of my nightmare scenario is after all this stuff I've done in the backcountry and all the thousands of miles I've done solo and with a partner, it's like I'm finally stuck somewhere with a really sick partner, you know, sick or injured. And oh my God, like I've heard of this happening and now this is my scenario. I woke up, you know, like when you know something's wrong, like I remember still being half asleep and realizing that Matt was sitting up and rocking back and forth in the tent. And I was like, oh, fudge like where this is he's sick again and I asked him like oh my god what's wrong what's going on and then I realized he was super sick and he was crawling out to get sick and coming back in and so then yeah he'd lie down for a little bit and then there were like the 
keto burps and I remember I didn't obviously didn't sleep at all because I was just lying there thinking like we talked you know briefly what between like his bouts of being sick like he won't be able to bike in the morning and we're out here and I was picturing every turn that we had taken that was taking us further from any kind of good road or developed campsite and how remote most of the day had been on the bikes and how like I remember thinking, oh man, we're not in a great spot right now for this to be happening. And I wish we hadn't left Pinedale and all this stuff as he's really sick. And so I was starting around midnight whenever he woke up with those horrible stomach pains. I was trying to go through my head about like, what are our options here? And then I said, okay, well, there is one family kind of around the other side of the lake. And so I lay there and I waited until it got light. I just said, okay, I'm mad. Like, what if I asked that family, you know, they're leaving tomorrow. What if I asked them if we can just put our bikes, they had a camper and a truck bed. What if I asked them for a ride out? And that was, you know, talking to Matt at that point, was it, it wasn't like having a conversation with a person who was doing well, but I think we were both kind of like, that's a last resort. And then as he got sicker throughout the night, it's like, okay, that is our only chance. And so just kind of lying there with like my heart racing in a panic because I'm really great in emergency situations uh, waiting for it to get light out. And so as soon as it started getting light out pretty early at that point, like in the early fives, I would leave the tent and go through the trees and try to spot to see if they were awake yet. They had two small kids. So I thought maybe, maybe they're going to start waking up and then we can see if we can get a ride with them. And so finally on like my fourth trip out of the tent to go see if they were awake, I saw the dad had left the camper. And so I just, you know, I went over there kind of very upset, very stressed, and just kind of burst out like with this rather like, hey, I know I didn't talk to you yesterday and you talked to my boyfriend and he's actually really sick. He got really sick. Are you guys leaving today? Blah, 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 blah. Like just in a complete panicked rush. And she definitely startled me. I was not expecting that. Uh, but right away, you could tell she was upset. She was hurting and unsure. And she asked for a ride right away or if they could get a ride out. And on, on my first thought is, is, is no. I got a beautiful wife. I got two small kids. I don't know who you are. I know kind of where I'm at, but I have no idea how far it is or how long it's going to take us to get off of this road, nor do I know the conditions. So remember that big little decision we talked about earlier? This is it. Yeah. And so this is kind of where um, Matt and I are big fallacy comes into play um, because it didn't occur to me that it was, you know, such an emergency that we had to call for search and rescue. Um, I wanted to ride out in a truck bed. And so we asked the guy and he said, he kind of, he was trying really hard to figure out how to make it work with us, but they are, they had two kids, his wife and him in this kind of small camper and a completely packed truck bed. He said, okay, we can't give you a ride out. And then I started bawling. You know, I could tell Maggie was upset, but I, I really didn't, I didn't know them. And trying to problem solve what was going on, like we didn't have room in the truck between the car seats and the kids. Uh, and as she said about riding in the back of the truck or in the camper and just trying to come up with ways to help them, it, it struck me that I have the Garmin in reach. And I was just like, hey, I got an SOS button on this. You want me to hit that? You know, I've never done it before, but it's advertised as help is on the way and she's like no no what are, like what about just contacting forest service i don't know that i have that information on me at that point in time but i didn't know how to contact my mom and so it was sunday i believe it was sunday morning i messaged my mom using the garment in reach said hey we got a situation here would you be willing to contact forest service and she, she jumped right off back here they live here in pennsylvania and uh messaged me back there's a little couple minute delay that uh, Forest Service is closed on Sunday and uh, she did not have access to them. He said, we can try to get in touch with the Forest Service and they can send a truck out to pick you guys up. And I said, oh my God, thank you. And then in my brain as an outdoor industry professional, I, I had this vision of Matt and I in his room and he held up his own inReach Mini before we left. And he said, should we take this? And I said, nah, I think we're good. We both have a ton of experience. This isn't the most remote thing either of us have ever done. And we didn't want to turn the subscription on. We didn't want to pay for another subscription. And I just remember hearing the thunk of the inReach as it hit the box. And I thought, oh my God, we're out here in a really bad situation. And we, he has, this guy at the campsite 
thank God has an inReach and there's one person at this site with us, but we don't even, we don't even have our own way of calling for help. And so that was, that would, you know, has haunted me ever since. Um, they, for the next couple hours, went back and forth with his mom, triangulating between him, his mom, the Pinedale County's search and rescue, which then got bounced to Teton County. And so from there, it was several hours of coordinating and then back and forth and moving Matt into the shade and moving the tent around and trying not to cry from stress. And yeah. And then they showed up. It was definitely the weekend, probably Saturday. Um, it was it was very unusual because it was early in the morning. It was, you know, between six and seven. And so that's an unusual time for, for SAR call outs. And most of those are you know, like missing persons early in the morning. So I'm Ed Fries. I'm a SAR volunteer since 2007. And I'm, my work is IT consulting. And yeah, kind of, it's a, it's a very rewarding thing being on SAR. I got the call and it was, I, you know, it was clearly it was a medical, right? Not an injury. And so medicals are kind of hard. Um, you know, a lot of times it's vague, you know, I don't feel good or my, my chest pains or not well defined. And especially because the inReach wasn't theirs, um, we didn't know exactly who they were. We probably had their age and that was about it. We didn't have, you know, history. We didn't know they're from Bozeman. The initial report we got was they wanted to go to Pinedale or they wanted to go to Dubois, which really wasn't going to help them medically. And so we were like, yeah, we're not sure about that. Pretty sure we had uh, AJ, a doctor on the on the call. And he said, well, and we were trying to figure out, should we fly them out? You know, and at that time we didn't have our own helicopter and we were going to have to request one from uh, Grand Teton National Park, who's, you know, a great partner and does a ton of work for us. <laughs> like, they'll just like, yeah, we'll take that rescue. Don't worry about it. Um, and they had flown a couple over in, on that side already that year. And so we decided, well, it probably wasn't serious enough to fly, but that um, we needed to get moving. We needed to get there and transport and that what we could do is if we needed to once we got on scene we could fly them out but you know we did the math on the drive and we we're trying to plot you know do we go south do we go north and we we're like this is going to take a long time and it did they had you know maggie and matt matt suffering and maggie's you know probably stressing out but by the from the time they called at six we probably didn't get there till uh, i don't know probably around noon it was uh me and andrew armington just the two of us we took our primary SAR rig, which is a pickup truck. And then we took the trailer with the Razor, the side-by-side. -side. And because we weren't sure uh, how rough that road was going to be and how far we'd be able to take the big rig and, and the trailer. You know, we drove over Togety Pass and then came back down, started moving on Grassy Lake Road. And gosh, it's a long way. I think we drove 15 miles and we had another 10 or 15 to go where we went in the Razor because um, we weren't sure we we're going to be able to turn around with the with the trailer? Um, Union Pass Road. Union Pass Road. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Union Pass Road. So, yeah, we found a good parking spot, jumped, switched over the Razor, and just started cruising, which, you know, good for, it's fast, but unfortunately for Matt, that's not the, it's not a comfy ride. <laughs> it's a little rough, kind of tight. We made sure we took the Razor that has the bike rack on it um, so that we could get their bikes out and get all their gear out. Otherwise, that was going to be, uh, it's going to be a problem. We didn't want to have to drive that in a loop twice. You know, you know, there's so much behind the scenes stuff, right? And so, you know, we had Anthony Stevens, I think, was incident command. And so he was checking in with us, at, you know, so he's he's tracking us on Sartopo. And then we're, you know, so he knows what our progress is. As long as we have cell coverage, he can see it. And then uh, occasional radio checks just to see if we have comms back. And so it was, it was in and out, kind of lose it. And then we gained it back a little bit at the end. And then, uh, you know, Andrew, we get closer and Andrew and I start talking about who's going to do the, the patient assessment and who's going to talk to the RP, the reporting party, and, you know, what our overall plan was. And, and then also about a lot of times there's some, it's not always awkward, but people don't understand what our decision making process is. And sometimes there isn't really time to explain it or have that. Once we show up, we kind of, you know, we make a plan and that might not align with what their plan is, but that's still going to be most likely the plan that we want to execute, partly because uh, there's more factors involved, you know, risk management and our responsibility as first responders, excuse me, 
And so, you know, we were prepared to fly them out. The family stayed because they were the point of contact and, and they were so nice. One of the worst things was the uncertainty. I remember looking at my watch and watching the seconds go by and thinking, okay, if I can stay calm for another 20 minutes, it'll be 820 and maybe I'll hear someone coming. And then if I can stay, okay, 15 more minutes and at, you know, at this time. And so I was just trying to stay not hysterical around Matt, who was sick and just act calm and tell him, oh yeah, no, they're coming. And a couple of times he was in and out, but he said, he's like, what if no one's coming? And I said, no, no, they're definitely coming, but I had no idea. And, um, but then the man with the, with the inReach, he came over a few times to update us. And he said, hey, they just got back in touch. It's actually going to be, you know, Teton County is on their way. And it just, the flood of relief I felt when he said that was, you, see, you can't even describe it. Andrew took the lead. He he went over to Matt, did the patient assessment, patient report, and you know, we both said hi to Maggie and, and then I uh, stayed with Maggie and talked to her a little bit. And then we both walked over and kind of assessed the scene. And it's really interesting to hear them talk about, you know, the gear they brought and how light they were. And these guys are serious, serious people and, and very hardcore. And they were traveling super minimal. And to think of uh, Matt, number one, being sick all night and then Maggie next to him, like this was a tiny, tiny tent. And it just looked, it looked like a rough night to spend if you were that sick. Just you just had to feel for him. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't feeling great. At, still, I was. It was that thing where I was starting to feel a little better, just because as the day goes, it kind of like improves. But as Maggie was saying, I didn't. I didn't know who was coming at all. So it's like, oh, like I saw the the SAR Razor show up, and it was. It's like they brought in the the cavalry. You know, I was I was happy to see someone there, and I. Like in my mind, they, they'd gotten there quick because I was just kind of like dozing, sleeping all morning in and out of it. And then it was a little surreal, you know, them coming over because just a month before I'd done my wilderness first responder refresher. And for guiding work, we're always practicing scenarios and going through like mock rescue stuff. And I'm, I'm always the one kind of on the other side of things patient assessment and, and A&O times four, like, do you know your name, where you are, all this, and everything that goes in, involved with like a rescue or like helping someone out. So it felt kind of like just a, a mock scenario again, but you know, it's it's like the real life thing going on and, and I'm, the, I'm the sick person. It was nice to see them. Um, and then it was strapping into that razor for a, a nice bumpy ride out of there and trying not to throw up all over everyone. When I heard the engine from the Razor come, I <laughs> was not chill. I like ran down to meet Ed and Andrew and I was bawling because I was so relieved. And I think they were kind of, I remember one of them saying that they thought they'd gotten totally sandbagged and that this, my partner was like basically dead just because my reaction. <laughs> but I had just, at that point, I don't know, it had been, you know, almost 12 hours of me just this constant, like absolute elevated nervous system escalated um, everything was just like firing because I was so stressed. And so, um, yeah, the relief, I think I just was bawling while they, <laughs> and then I helped pack up the campsite and everything and um, threw everything into our bike bags and could not believe they had a bike rack on this thing. I just assumed we would leave our bikes there and come back for them later. Like Matt and I would figure out how to come back. But then I thought, oh yeah, this is Teton County search and rescue. Of course they rescue mountain bikers. So of course they have a bike rack on their, on their razor. That's just incredible. And um, Ed and Andrew were so nice. They had a conversation with me the whole time. They were joking. They, you know, Matt was <laughs> dozing, but um, yeah, they, Ed and Andrew were just incredible. I just feel so indebted to them for this full day rescue that they did for us. The focus on psychological first aid and emotional support. Initially you think, oh, you have, you have to help the, the patient, but really the patients, mostly they need their support afterward. You know, they need medical care. They don't need psychological care right then. Usually it's the partner because the partners has to watch the patients injured, ill, suffer. And, you know, they have limited uh, resources to deal with it. And even with the most, you know, skilled person, there's just not too much you can do if you can't either transport them or, or alleviate whatever the misery is. And so, yeah, we showed up and, and Maggie was, she was upset and she had reason to be. Um, and it definitely got, you know, our attention that, that, you know, we didn't know what we were walking into and, and it was like, okay, this is real. This isn't like, we're just tired and we need to ride out. This is for real. And Matt was just like, I, I can, I can ride. I can sit in the, you know, and, and he, he was a trooper, but you know, he couldn't hold his head up. Like he, he literally was, he was done. He couldn't, he, he, he would just 
fall over. And he was, you know, Maggie was helping him. We were trying to prop him up with jackets and he, he just was, he was at zero. And, and Maggie had managed it. We didn't know the whole story, but clearly Maggie had been managing it for hours and hours and hours. There's a lot on her shoulders. No, they pulled up. They collapsed their tent. They loaded up their bikes. They loaded up Maggie. They loaded up Matt. Like, they was all inclusive. And even though we weren't part of it, they checked on us. It was it was pretty neat. It was, it was really neat. Care beyond just the illness you're dealing with. So, which it is, especially in their situation, you know, if they would have left Maggie there by herself or they would have took Matt and Maggie and left their gear there. They're hours back the dirt road. And how is Maggie going to get that while Matt's recovering? So that was, that was pretty cool. We knew he was sick. We knew that there wasn't, you know, we were trying to just give him fluids and, and he was doing his best to keep it down. It sounds a little bit like what from Matt was saying that he got diagnosed with rhabdo. Is that, and, but whatever it was, we never heard, you know, further, which is normal. You know, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I got to the hospital, did some tests. Uh, at the time there, I had a, a stomach virus is what they told me when they ran the tests and then the, the keto keto acidosis like the whole keto thing kind of mm. eating away at myself was uh, contributed to a lot of the pain i think stayed in, in jackson that night and then uh, luckily enough a friend was nearby and drove us back up to bozeman the next day um then i spent almost a month on on my couch and um i thought i was just you know stomach virus you just waited out kind of there's no antibiotics or anything and then wasn't getting any better and went back in I had gotten um, Giardia and Campylobacter as well, which I'm not sure when those came along. So it was like a, a, a threefold thing. I had had Giardia 12 years ago or so when I was traveling in, in Guatemala, swam in a lake and got Giardia there. And they said, what the nurse told me was that it's, it's in your system. So, you know, that might've just popped back up from being in my system and being weakened. But overall, it was stomach virus, Giardia, and Campylobacter, and then that keto thing going on. So, and then lost 23 pounds, and I'm already pretty thin to begin with. So, my body was pretty depleted and um, kind of starting from zero again. I'm not sure when the initial sickness happened with the, the stomach virus. That seemed to be the first thing that came along. I think it was some pepperoni that I ate that had been in my bike bag for a bit too long. It's just one of those things that, that adds on top of each other, like mistakes add up. We thought, you know, there'd be a store coming up ahead, thought there'd be places to refuel where there weren't. So we didn't pick up enough food to begin with, didn't have these refueling points. And I'm just kind of like eating whatever we have. Um, Cause I'm like, I know I need more sustenance. So it's like, Oh, I have this old pepperoni that I haven't looked at in a week. You know, I can eat that. It's got some protein. I don't know if that was it or not, but I kind of have an aversion to that now. So your body's kind of telling you. Being a guide, like so far, I have a I have a, a perfect track record. I, I don't know of any guests that have gotten sick on any of my trips. So I'm usually pretty good about hand washing and like just taking care and like treating water. We were treating every everything that we drank, you know, but when you're on your own, it's just you, you you're a little less conservative. You take, you just, you go go along with things a bit more than I would be if I was working. But, you know, of course, treating your water, not eating suspect foods, packing your bike a little, a little more overflowing. We would always, we already had like bagels and bags of chips and things bungee rope to the tops of our packs. But that was my first time doing a bike packing trip. Now I have it more together going forward. And I know a better system for packing food and like what kind of space I need. It's one of those terrible things where you don't think it's going to be you that gets sick yeah <laughs> well obviously i'd bring an in reach mini <laughs> with me and i think yeah that's kind of the crux of this whole event for me is the fact that if that other family hadn't been at this remote lake that nobody else was at um i don't know how i would have i probably would have ended up biking back towards pinedale and hoping to run into someone and i think just that whatever our get out of jail free card was for making such an error as to not have our own communication device 
um, that was the get out of jail free card. And that's kind of why I'll end up writing about this for some of my outlets. And I agreed to, you know, I was happy to talk about it on this podcast because I think um, aside from the shame I feel about making a mistake like that as someone with so much experience, both of us are highly experienced. We both work in the outdoor industry professionally and um, I have so much backcountry experience. And to think that, to look at a route like this and think, okay, yeah, it's pretty populated. I've done more remote things and nothing bad has happened. And we're both experienced enough. We have bikes. It's not like we're gonna be on foot to add up all of these factors as a decision-making tool to not bring that backup communication because it is a hassle to turn it on, to get the subscription back. We already don't have any room in our bags. Like there's always room for an emergency communication device. And I think, like I said, one of the reasons that I will talk about this mistake at the risk of, you know, being drawn and quartered on the internet is that, you know, serve it as a warning to other people that no matter how experienced you are, and how much you take, how tame you think the route looks, um, it could always happen to you. It doesn't matter if your partner's the one who's usually doing the simulated rescues and has, you know, the backcountry rescue experience. He's the one that's going to get sick, and you don't know. It could have been, it could have been me wrecking my bike and breaking a bone. It could have been me getting sick. It could have been Matt breaking a bone. Um, and so, yeah, that I think when I told people what had happened when we got back everyone in my life who does not do backcountry things just said, oh, we're so glad somebody was there. And we're so glad that, you know, Teton County SAR was able to come get you. And every person in my life who does do backcountry things, the first thing they said was after, we're glad you're okay, was why didn't you have your own device? And it was crazy. You know, my mom who doesn't do anything outdoors like that was just so glad we were okay. And one of my friends who's on the Carbon County SAR, she said, Maggie, you know, I love you, but why did you guys not have your own device? And so I think obviously um, that was just a really hard way with a good conclusion to learn that lesson. And I'm happy to talk about it. Just say like, hey, don't do this. Be, be smarter. You're not too experienced to not get into trouble on a relatively you know, populated route. Thing, one of the interesting things about this is, is that you know, a lot of rescues make the front page and then you know, they, because they're exciting or glamorous and um, you know, there's a helicopter involved, maybe something. And, and a lot of people have comments like, oh, they shouldn't have been doing that, or that was dumb, or, you know, excessive risk taking. And this situation is you have two very experienced, very skilled, very fit people who'd been, at that point, they'd been riding for a month. And sometimes things just happen. Like, it's not anyone's fault. It's not, even if you had an injury, somebody still was sick. That was just how you got help. It didn't, you know, it wasn't going to change that people can get sick or people can break their ankle or, you know, something. And so it's just an example of so we were able to help someone out, number one, which is great. And number two, it, it's not always about sometimes things just happen. It's not always about a mistake. You know, one of the things I talk about, you know, teaching avalanche classes, too, is just like complacency. You you do things a lot and nothing, nothing bad happens. So you just assume nothing bad is going to happen, especially this kind of thing, because that's just like not going mountain biking. I'm not backcountry skiing. I'm not doing like a dangerous quote unquote activity. So, you know, what are the chances that I'm going to need something bad's going to happen? You know, I was thinking we'll have a, a blown tire, a broken bike or something. And then, you know, one of us will just stay with it and one of us will go get help or just that kind of like complacency been there, never needed it before. Um, but it's such a small thing, you know, it weighs half a pound. It would have been so easy to take 10 minutes and renew the subscription and, uh, and bring it with us. Glad that person was there. Um, thank you to them. And thank you to my friend, Brian, who, who gave us a ride back up to Bozeman, um, 12 hour notice and, and all the people that are around to help out. And thank you to, to Ed and Andrew that were, they were there and took their, basically their entire Saturday. I'm sure they could have found much more fun things to do than cart my six self around. We did 1600 miles, I think. And then eventually we could break it up. We have 1,100 miles of the route left. And so, yeah, we'll finish it eventually. But I kind of, I'm going to do some backpacking this summer, I think, coming up <laughs> with a with an in-reach mini in my bag at all times with a subscription turned on. I'm just thankful this time um, there was a lot of good people on the other end. Thank you for listening to The Fine Line. That was Maggie Slepian, Matt Marr, Mike Baum, and Teton County Search and Rescue volunteer Ed Breeze. Our editing is by Melinda Binks. 
Our theme song is by Anne and Pete Sibley, with additional music written and produced by Ben Winship. The original cover art is by Jen Reddy, and my name is Matt Hansen. This podcast is produced by Backcountry Zero, a project of the Teton County Search and Rescue Foundation to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries in the Jackson Hole backcountry. We'll be back with another episode in a few short weeks. Learn more at backcountryzero.com.